mind frame at all. Action. That's not a, uh, <laughs> a confident start for a video that's going to be about YouTube. Hi. So... I'm Father Blythe. Welcome to my channel, my first video of, well, first like official video of 2023. Happy New Year. I figured this would be a good video to start the new year since a lot of people set goals and whatnot. I started my YouTube in like May, <laughs> so you definitely don't have to start it in January, but I'd started planning it in January at that time. Yes, that's right. This video is about you. If you have ever wanted to be a pagan or witchy or Hellenic polytheist YouTuber, this is your sign. If you have ever wanted to be a content creator in either one of those spheres, this is your sign. This is my call to action. We want you for the pagan... It, uh, I don't know. I can't come up with a good name that doesn't sound like weirdly militaristic. Also, I chose my shirt specifically for today. This is nearly famous. It's one of my favorite shirts. This look I have going on here is what I like to call rave grandma, where it looks kind of like I just got home from a rave and it's 9 p.m. and I'm ready for bed. <laughs> Pro tip, make sure you can read your uh, script. I tried zooming out because I wasn't like fully confident that I wasn't cutting myself off. Pro tip. Make sure you're in frame and in focus. So I've had people tell me plenty of times that they would love to be a content creator, whether it's on YouTube or a podcaster or just making stuff, but they're not sure how or they're not sure if they're good enough or if they know enough information or they don't have a camera, they don't have time or, 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 and so on and so forth. Well, I thought all those things and more when I started and then restarted and then re-restarted and then re-re-restarted. <laughs> my YouTube channel. I've, if you've been around, you've probably heard me mention that I have been trying to do YouTube since literally YouTube started. And obviously none of the previous ones have stuck, which I might get into at a later date. Being a content creator is a lot of work. I'm not going to deny that, but I think one thing that can be amazing is when there's a network of content creators, right? Because how many how to be how to start witchcraft videos are there there's a lot and honestly i've watched a significant portion of them just for like kind of research reasons and honestly once you've watched one or two you've pretty much got all the information that you need so i don't think we need to necessarily be in direct competition in fact we can grow each other quite a bit but i'll get into that a little later i'm kind of structuring this video in several different sections i'm going to talk about common doubts slash myths but mostly doubts and how to face them what kind of content creator you can be spoiler alert there's a lot of them and a lot more that are not like front facing or using your voice like your literal voice and not all of them have to be ac academic but that's for that section then i'm also going to talk about practical tips so that'll be pretty much exclusively tailored to YouTube, so you can feel free to skip that section if you're not interested. So obviously, I'm a primarily a YouTuber. I do podcasting as well, but I'm primarily a YouTuber, so my content will focus on that. Although I do have experience in all forms of content creation because that's literally what I went to school for. So if you have questions or thoughts, you can you know, feel free to ask me in the comments and I will let you know. Before I get started, I wanna give an absolute shout out to my patrons. If you don't know, if you've somehow missed last time's video, I almost said last week, <laughs> schedules, don't know her. If you somehow missed last time's video, I recently started a Patreon and I am loving it so far. I'm really loving to get to know you guys as well as sharing parts about my life that I don't usually share, like songs or I recently published a video on the worst book, well, it was basically the worst book I'd ever read, but definitely the worst witchcraft book I've ever read. So if you go to my Patreon, which I will link above, you can feel free to check that out. It's a good time. It starts as low as $1, and I just, we like to be chatty over there. But this is a specific shout out to Grumpy Grandpa, Hi Quintos, Ambrose, Brooke Smoody, Ember Kelly, and Micro Maria, who are my $5 and above patrons. Thank you so much. Let's talk about some myths. The number one myth that I see and that I personally deal with on a regular basis, or the first doubt that I see and I deal with on a regular basis, is 
having it all figured out. I don't know anything. I don't know how many times I have to say that in a video. This is definitely the biggest concern that I've heard next to time constraints. But this is one that I think everybody deals with. I mean, and honestly, I don't think it ever goes away, really. You just kind of get better at pushing through it. Even if you look at the classics field, right? People who have literal PhDs in classics are constantly discovering new information or challenging their beliefs. I mean, the classics field looks so different now that it did even 50, hell, 25 years ago. It's constantly changing, constantly evolving. It's a conversation, not a definitive stopping point, if that makes sense. You don't have to do anything academic. My content has shifted away from academic stuff, mostly because of time constraints. You can also always remake videos. There are tons of academic content creators here on YouTube who remake their videos once they get new information. And if you're like really like you want to do academic content, but you're still worried about having it all figured out, start with something that you think is common knowledge or something that feels easy for you. In fact, people are more likely to watch basic based videos than any other kind of advanced video. So start there, start simple. The other myth is that you need a nice camera. You don't, or like nice equipment. I'm part of a Discord server for witchy or pagan content creators. And there's a lot of people on there who literally film with their iPhone cameras and have way more subscribers than I do. In fact, I actually follow a YouTuber who has, I think she just hit a million subs, but she filmed up until very recently exclusively on her iPhone. And in fact, she still mostly films on her iPhone. She just uses the camera for other more landscapey shots. For most of my videos, this microphone is not new by any means, and I've used it before. I recently started using it because I've gotten a bit annoyed with how sound filters in when I'm trying to record. But I generally record my videos on just my computer sound through Audacity, which works perfectly fine. Uh, this microphone is one that I bought when I was doing, I do music recording as well. So this is a microphone that I use for that. In terms of me, the camera that I use primarily was a camera that I bought with my sister right before high school graduation. So that was eight years ago. Oh my. I was a new media student in college, which I don't have time to explain what that is, but it's basically YouTube and stuff. So I did a lot of, my did a lot of filming specifically. I filmed my entire senior project on that camera. I filmed all of my video art stuff. I've filmed all of my cinema studies stuff on that camera. So I basically used that camera constantly and it was, uh, I spent $250 on it. It was around $500. It is basically less than a DSLR, like in terms of capabilities. So for me, I was taught when I was learning how to do filmography and photography that the most important thing is not your tool, it's how you use it. You can make beautiful shots. I mean, there have been movies that have been shot on iPhones, not like Hollywood movies, but there have been movies <laughs> shot on iPhones. But your tool is about how you use it. And the only time you need to upgrade your tool is when you feel that your tool is holding you back and not just holding you back, but actively being detrimental to your work. So the camera that I use now, I've been saving up for, for four, four years before I got it. And honestly, I'm glad I didn't get it before because it's really overwhelming and you wanna make the starting process as simple as possible. Oh, also I've also used my iPhone before. <laughs> What am I talking about? Watch some tutorials. There's plenty of people like Peter McKinnon. He's an amazing filmographer who teaches filmography. YouTube is a great resource in and of itself. It's fine if you start there. It's also fine if you just start with the freaking white wall. In terms of getting started, I've heard of people who actually recorded several dummy videos where they knew they weren't going to post it anywhere and they just recorded so they got used to talking to a camera. You also don't have to have any camera. You know, Aaliyah Kai, who's going to show up here in a moment, doesn't use a camera, just does voiceover and B-roll and stock footage. The other thing is I don't have time. Now, I'm not going to tell you, oh, well, if you just blah, 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 blah. No, I'm not here to tell you that. But I'm here to tell you that this one is hard. I'm sure your favorite YouTubers, even if they do this full time, struggle with it. There's a reason I went from two to one videos a month. Finding time is extraordinarily difficult, especially in the beginning. Just as I say in my videos about practicing, don't fit your life around your practice, but fit your practice around your life. The same thing applies here. Until you start making significant money <laughs> around YouTube, or even maybe never, don't 
bend your life necessarily to YouTube. You know, sometimes you you can say to yourself, oh, on my day off, I'm going to set aside an hour and record a vlog. You can do that. There are certainly sacrifices that you can make, but that's a decision that's between you and your schedule. Also, there are plenty of people who release videos very infrequently. I follow a couple YouTubers who have hundreds of thousands of subscribers who release videos like every other month or even longer than that, especially if they make significantly long form content. Now, obviously that can be disheartening in the beginning. It can be hard to get momentum because generally people aren't gonna subscribe if you only have one or two videos that are months apart, but you can still grow that way. It's just a lot slower, so keep that in mind. What kind of content do we need and why? And despite the title of this video, as I've mentioned a couple times, we need more than just YouTubers. We need podcasters, we need artists, we need musicians, we need everybody, all hands on tech. So I'm actually gonna hand it over to my dear friend, Alia Kai, who is going to talk a bit more about this. It's all you, Allie. Thank you so much, Fel. If y'all didn't know, hi, my name is Alia Kai, and I do education and allyship content with a focus on classical era Athenian Hellenic revivalism. One of the things that I'm known for saying in my community, the Xandia Bridge allyship discord server, is that we need more content creators. That's not just YouTubers, by the way. When you think about the big world religions, they have artists and creatives of all kinds. Though, of course, the topics that I can give the best advice on are writing and YouTube. If a Christian, in most denominations, wants to consume nothing but Christian media, they have a whole selection of music, novels, videos, movies, TV shows, comics, you name it. Catholics have a massive selection of art and figures to easily decorate their homes with. Bible verses are turned into decorative calligraphy to grace people's walls. It's a veritable cornucopia copia of things that can help reinforce their beliefs and keep them central in their daily lives if they want. Now, I'm not saying total immersion is actually a good thing. If anything, it can get a bit fanatical if that's all you indulge in. But the point is, the sheer selection allows someone from one of the world religions to engage with their tradition outside of prayer, church, and Bible study, which would be the equivalent to ritual prayer and offering in pagan traditions. And there's an entire sub-market that has spawned from that. Content creators who film themselves as they work on devotional art or who talk about their daily lives vlog style and how their religion plays into that. Witches and occultists have a lot of these sorts of creators, but most tradition-minded revivalists have a hard time finding educational content geared towards reconstruction rather than just explorations of the old myths or historical exploration from a secular lens, let alone the wide range of artistic and daily life content enjoyed by other larger traditions. I also believe that in addition to sacred artists, which we should absolutely support and encourage, by the way, there's nothing wrong with compensating someone with skill for good work, the gods will continue to inspire us with new stories as they did in ancient times. As time goes on and our communities develop, there will be more and more need for not mere retellings of myths that applied to ancient cultures, but new myths that contextualize history or are simply divinely inspired stories meant to teach about the gods but through the modern cultural lens. These myths will be no less divinely inspired than the ancient plays, rites, and epics we have surviving from ancient times, but they will have modern cultural context that may make them easier to understand for modern people. Music is going to be essential, and I'm not talking about the Irish folk-style tunes that most people think of as pagan music, nor just about the reconstructions of ancient music, though I know of at least one person who does plan on becoming a content creator and working on that. I'm talking about modern pagan rock songs, rap songs, country, hip-hop, everything in between and beyond. Whatever you might think of Christian music, it's impossible to deny the sheer weight of it across many genres, and some of it's pretty decent. We shouldn't just have Irish folk tunes and heavy metal to turn to as pagans. With proper community support, we could have a thriving music scene across traditions, and if you're looking for YouTube content ideas, the making of and premiering of said music make for an incredibly popular channel. Just look at that guy on TikTok who's working on turning the Odyssey into a musical. If you think just beyond the ancient myths, the possibilities are endless. Plus, music was a really important part of both culture and worship in ancient Greece, so our largely musicless modern practice isn't very traditional to begin with. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that there are pitfalls to becoming a content creator. It's no secret that pagan communities can have a flair for the dramatic regardless of political orientation, and no, I'm not one of those no politics and paganism types, I'm unabashedly leftist and my content is too. But there are people within the community who love to stir up drama and hate, no matter what you're doing, and some of them can be pretty relentless. It's important to know that attracting their attention is a risk and to practice proper online hygiene and safety with your personal information if you want to put yourself out there. It's also pretty important to know why you're actually making your content. The rewards can be amazing, but if you get into it 
because you want fame and recognition, you might not have the endurance to stick it out. Make sure you're doing something you actually love, that you're passionate about, and treasure the time when you're not well known. You'll have a lot more freedom when you have less than 5,000 subscribers than you ever would at 10k+. plus. The more people follow you, the more pressure there is to please them and the almighty algorithm, at least on YouTube. And the more of the aforementioned folks whose attention you might not want will likely take notice. I'm not out here to dissuade anyone. Again, it's pretty clear that I think we need more in diverse p voices in pagan movements, especially in Hellenism where we have so few actual Hellenic polytheists making content. It's a conversation my buddy Fel and I have had many times, and I'm glad that she invited me on today to chat with y'all about it. Give me a shout out in the comments of one of my vids sometime, or pop me a message in the server if you're inspired to make Hellenist content so we can connect sometime. Well, unless you're a nationalist or a folkist then we probably wouldn't get along. Either way, thanks for tuning in, and I'll turn it back over to Fel. We're stronger together. Thanks, Aaliyah Kai. Make sure to go check out her channel. She does awesome work over there, and honestly, my channel would not be here if she didn't pave the way first. Oh, I just saw my new neighbors. Hi, guys. So here are examples of content. Ali mentioned some, but I will mention others. You can make modern myths. Controversial one, but I think one that we need to dive into. You can make visual art, you can make songs, you can make crafts. I've made a ton of crafts before. You can make artsy vlogs, you can make film, you can make animation, you can make graphic novels. You know, the people who are not Hellenic polytheists have made a lot of content around Greek myths. It would be nice to have content that is actually made. <laughs> by Hellenic polytheists who have a little bit of a more nuanced understanding. Practical tips. So how do you actually make a video? It's a deceptively simple task. Turn on your camera and press record and that's all there is to it, right? I'm sure you can assume that that is not the case. The first thing you will learn about making videos is that it takes way, way longer than you expect it to. There's a reason movies take months and even years to complete, even if they are just an hour and a half or two hours long. For me, filming itself tends to be the shortest process, unless I'm making Day in the Life of a Hellenic Polytheist, where I'd use a lot of B-roll, which is kind of like the fancy filler footage, and I use more actual filmmaking techniques. That one, the production was significantly longer, but not as long as post-production. Speaking of, before I get ahead of myself, there are three main parts of, of video making. And this goes for movies. This goes, I would say, for any sort of digital media. There's pre-production, production, and post-production. Now, pre-production is things like scripting and research, at least when it comes for me and my YouTube videos. This can also look like location scouting, drawing out shots, which I do for more filmmaking stuff, but most YouTubers who do this kind of content don't do that. So this can be my longest part and it's usually my longest phase during the video making process but it can also be my shortest too especially in videos like my patreon announcement <laughs> video i had i don't think any pre-production unless you count actually making the patreon pre-production which i would not in that case so it can be anywhere from 20 minutes to 10 full hours or even longer if there's a lot to research production is exactly what it sounds like it's you know getting your hair ready, doing your makeup, putting your clothes on when you've been in pajamas all day, setting up your tripod, turning on your camera, and then letting your camera die and letting your SD cards run out and then having to do that again. That's all part of production. It's usually the fastest for me. A 20 minute video usually takes around an hour, man, maybe an hour and 15 to film. So then the last phase and my least favorite phase is post production. I wish I liked post-production. I am unfortunately very good at post-production because of my new media background. And because I'm good at it, that means I have um, very high standards. So the idea of outsourcing it, that's a whole other hurdle for myself. Some people really love editing. So this is kind of when you're making a video, you have to figure out you're probably going to hate one of the process, one of the processes, and you're probably going to love one of the processes. So you, it's about, you know, figuring out which one you hate and which one you like. Some people hate filming. I love filming. It's, I could do this literally all day. So I know that I despise post-production and it makes me feel like I'm ripping my own teeth out. So that means I have to set aside a significant amount of time and not because, I mean, it will take me, it can take me up to six hours to post-produce, not including export time. That's just for editing. But I know that I have to set aside longer than that because I need a lot of emotional buffers there. With ADHD, this can be complicated. So I know that because of that, I need a lot of buddy time. I need a lot of people working side by side with me. <clears throat> Speaking of scripting, 
When it comes to scripting, some people have found that they can't make a video without a script. Some people can't use scripts. Some people use outlines. For a really long time, which is weird because I used to think that I would be better without a script, just completely off book. But I found with my research videos, which makes sense, that I had to have an extremely detailed word by word script. This video is very off the cuff. A lot of these videos I don't need to be heavily scripted. I do have an outline and some exact word by words written down. So that's a game, you know, try scripting, you know, try Try something, just try it. You know, you're not, especially as Aaliyah kind of mentioned, when you're in your early phases, people aren't gonna be riling against you if you change your format because frankly, you probably don't have a lot of subscribers in the beginning, so you're easier to change your format. Try scripting, try not scripting, try outlining, and you'll very quickly figure out what you hate and what you like. <laughs> Time management. Pfft. This was the thing that killed all of my other YouTube videos. That and not being willing to try different formats and being too hung up on one thing. It's okay, it's actually encouraged to emulate other people while you're finding your voice, but eventually you're gonna become yourself and let that happen. So time management. <laughs> I used to be on a really rigid schedule because if I didn't, my channel would die. Now I've gotten to the point where I have a lot of motivation because of you guys, and especially now because of my patrons, I have a lot of motivation to get something done, but I recommend you, I, I recommend you having a schedule. I recommend you having on this day, by this time, I will upload. My schedule ended up being more like by the weekend. So that would be Friday, Saturday, Sunday to give myself a little bit of grace period. Because sometimes if I would miss a deadline, I'd be like, fuck it, I'll wait till next week. Again, experiment. Maybe a rigid schedule doesn't work for you. It worked for me. It had to work. It was the only way that I could be held accountable. I actually have a really a much more advanced setup because of my college background. But what I do, microphone, laptop, camera, tripod. I strongly encourage you to invest in tripod. My tripod is probably not worth more than a dollar. I inherited it from my sister. If you're going to use a camera, use a tripod. It will make your life so much easier. I've been there where you're trying to forget stack books and then your camera falls and then you scream and cry. Use a tripod. They make tripods for iPhones as well. They also make like mounts. I also do have a ring light that I use every so often if I feel like setting it up. I really need to get better at lighting setups. That's when you start getting to the more advanced stages, when you start exploring more and you fall into a comfort, you don't need to worry about that first uh, First off. I also really want a teleprompter. Sorry, I'm checking my fucking... Whoa, motherfucker. Sound is still fucking stupid. Action again. I don't know why I didn't start with this SD card because it has 55 minutes. I could have filmed it all in one take. Comments, pressure, and other scary things. That was another thing that freaked me out for a while. And honestly, why I'm glad my YouTube didn't take off until when it did is because I would not have been in a good mental health space to handle certain comments. And like the reality is you are going to get nasty comments. And I will warn you, especially if you make like an intro to Hellenism video, focus. <sighs> to glom onto that. In fact, 90% of my negative comments are just on that video, which is kind of fine because it's my oldest video and I'm just like, whatever, you can direct all your hate over there. Let's just leave me alone. Generally, what I've heard is that you tend to get to a point where initially a lot of your comments are actually really positive. Of course, you know, you get the naysayers in there and the people who are like, yeah, your hair definitely makes you look like you're mentally ill. Okay, cool. I'm a rave grandma. Leave me alone. I've been through a lot. I'm old. You do get your negative comments here and there, but generally what I've heard is that when you're in your really developing stages, you get a lot of positive comments of people being like, wow, you're so great. I love you. Woo. Yeah, you're awesome. And then you eventually will hit a point where the algorithm pushes you more, meaning that you get put in front of people who don't agree with you <laughs> or you get put in front of a more mainstream audience. When it comes to comments, I mean, it's easy for me to say, just ignore them but I honestly just try to think about the headspace that that person's in. Almost 100% has nothing to do with you. Unless someone is calling you out legitimately, don't engage the trolls. Just like send them a thumbs up. That's my other favorite thing is I get a lot of comments. This is, you'll, you'd get these, uh, you're probably most comment, negative comments are like, you're gonna go to hell. I just send them a thumbs up <laughs> and then they don't know how to respond and I just keep sending thumbs up. Pressure. People have a habit of putting people who bother to film themselves and put themselves on the internet as authorities. I have complicated feelings on that because I don't see myself as an authority. I mean, I'm literally standing here in my giant mess of room. I try not to let myself be put on a pedestal. <laughs> cancel yourself before they can cancel you. <laughs> there can be pressure to be an authority, but just say, hey, you know, I'm not an authority. Have a life. Have a, have a life outside of YouTube. I, there's a lot of my life that I don't share. If I do share, it's with my patrons because I like talking. 
as you can probably tell, keep a little bit for yourself and it'll help you stay sane. Um, let me see. Money, 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 money. This again, probably won't be a concern for quite a while. You need at least a thousand subscribers and 4,000 hours of watch time. I believe unless they've changed it, that's what it was for me. And then at that point you can start putting ads on your videos. At the present time, I don't see myself taking sponsorships unless, um, I don't know, NordVPN wants to sponsor a micro-influencer. Hit me up, NordVPN. I have a, a big document that's like all my video ideas as well as a month-by-month -month play of my YouTube video, what videos I release, what I worked on, and then also how much money I made, if applicable, and also subscriber counts. Some people find keeping track of subscriber counts really stressful. I personally don't. Now that I've hit 5k, I'm just gonna have whatever because i know that to hit 10k it'll probably take me two years so i'm not even gonna worry about it now including patreon i think it can be important you know i remember when i was first starting out or looking into this as like an actual side hustle i really wanted to know how much money i could genuinely make as a they call people like us <laughs> micro niches so we're a niche that's even smaller than a niche which has its advantages i'd actually rather be a micro niche influencer than a drop in the pool of commentary youtubers I only recently started my Patreon, but with YouTube ads, and it slowly builds up, the more videos you make, the more ads you have. So naturally, it slowly increases over time. Just to give you a rough estimate, at this present point in time, January 25th, I make around $150 from YouTube a month. So definitely not nothing to sneeze at. Honestly, 90% of that is going to go straight back into the channel because I have a lot of backlog for subtitles to do. For a while I was making, like, essentially I calculated it was like 15 cents an hour if <laughs> I was paid for the hours I did this. All this I don't expect to make a living from this right away. I've definitely known people who are micro niche, who are in micro niches who make a living or at least make a significant portion of their income from YouTube. The advantage of being in a micro niche is people tend to watch your videos all the way through or have a higher retention rate throughout your video, which is all YouTube lingo that you can learn about. <laughs> all this being said, I genuinely believe in you. I believe that you can be a YouTuber. I can believe that you can be a content creator. Like I love this shit and I love helping people when it comes to getting off the ground. If you start a YouTube channel, send it my way and I'll take a look at it. I can give you constructive criticism. I will shout you out. You could post a comment. I'd rather not spam my comment, have my comments be spammed with self-promotion, but you can also email me. I'll put my email above. My email is also listed in all of my video descriptions. That's my final call to action. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you'd like to support me on Patreon, I will link that. Uh, that has already been linked above, but it's linked below. Uh, it really means a lot to me. It means that these videos can be improved. That means I can, you know, spend more time <laughs> doing videos. Shout out again to my $5 and above patrons, which is Grumpy Grandpa, Hi, Kinthos, Ambrose, Brooke Smoody, Amber Kelly, and Micro Maria. And then, of course, all of my other patrons who are in the $3 and above tier are listed here for you. Thank you guys so much. I've been loving chatting with you the past couple of weeks. And if you would like to join, again, link is down below. So, that being said, thank you so much for this very chaotic video. Thank you, Aaliyah Kai. And I will see you all in the next video and have a wonderful 2020.